Well, today we begin an exciting journey, and I wish that more of us were here to begin with us, but uh, I guess this is another one of those low Sundays. <laughs> but over the next several weeks, we're going to travel together with Jesus through the Gospel of Mark. But before we embark on this journey, it would be good to get our bearings. Now, most trips begin with a purpose in mind. And so first we might ask why we are going to read the Gospel of Mark rather than, say, Matthew or Luke. Because we did John a couple of years ago, you might remember, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Mark's Gospel is thought to be the oldest of all the biblical Gospels, preceding Matthew's and Luke's by 10 to 20 years, and John's by even as much as 50 years. Wow. So scholars also agree that Matthew and Luke used Mark as their source document for their own writings. So Mark's gospel is one of the oldest Christian writings that we can read. And by that reason alone, I think it's really important for us to know it. Now Mark, as the author, also had a purpose in mind when he wrote. It's important for us to look at Mark's reason for writing and the mode in which he chose to write. Now, a gospel was a particular form of narrative writing that was prevalent in the ancient world. Gospels were not strictly historical records or biographies, although they do contain verifiable historical data and personal data. Now, it's tempting, I think, for us to read a Christian gospel strictly for its historical and personal merit, but to do so results in our missing the main point of the author, which was to make a theological statement revealing for the reader something about God. Now this word gospel predated Christian times. It comes from the Greek word euangelion, which means the proclamation of good news. And it's the source of our word evangel evangelical or, e or even evangelistic. Those words come from that Greek word, excuse me. <clears throat> it was widely used by the Roman emperor cult to refer to the birth of a god, small g of course. An inscription dating to 9 BC about Caesar Augustus reads, The birthday of the God was for the whole world the beginning of good tidings of joy on his account. And so that word is gospel, good tidings. Mark, the writer, was John Mark. He was a disciple of the apostle Peter, who traveled with him on his missionary journeys. And so Mark collected and recorded Peter's eyewitness accounts of his time with Jesus. It was thought that Mark wrote the gospel in Rome soon after Peter was martyred around 62 AD. His purpose for writing was to witness to early Christians in and around Rome who were suffering systemic persecution for their beliefs after the great fire for which Nero held them responsible. From the first words of his gospel, Mark revealed his purpose to the readers. The true good news was not about any mere man, even the emperor. It was the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So Mark launches into his gospel abruptly. He immediately captures the hearer's attention. There is no infancy narrative as in Matthew and Luke. Just one verse, which contains three very important pieces of information. Here begins the good news. All other claims of good news had come in the form of Roman gods or the Caesars, were indisputably set aside. The good news was not of a mere man accorded the stature of a god by other humans. The good news was of Jesus Christ, the long-awaited Messiah, that's what Christ means, foretold by the prophets of Israel, the Son of God, God himself in human flesh. With his very first words, Mark sets the stage for the coming of the kingdom of God over and against the greatest kingdom of humankind. So his first words were extremely subversive in that Roman world. But Mark does not claim to be the sole witness to the story. He called upon the voices of the witnesses from of old, represented by Isaiah the prophet. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. The good news had begun centuries before when God told his people through the prophets Isaiah and Malachi that he would send a savior, a Messiah, and that before the Messiah, 
he would send a witness to prepare the people to receive him. That witness would be John. And so Mark goes on. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And, it was, and this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, even in his birth, John, who is the cousin of Jesus, born six months before him, John came before Jesus to prepare his way. Mark's description of John unmistakably depicts him in the light of the great prophets of old. Elijah was described as a man with a garment of hair and a leather belt around his waist. And although Malachi described Elijah as the messenger preparing the way for the Lord, Mark connected this prophecy to John. And like Elijah, he lived in the wilderness. And like the prophet Daniel, John abstained from meat and wine in favor of locusts and wild honey. Mark clearly depicted John's ministry as the fulfillment of part of God's plan revealed to the ancient prophetic witnesses. Now John's witness urged those who heard him to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Repentance was much more than just being sorry or trying to be better. In the Greek, the word is metanoia, and Mark imparted the full force of the word, which means a complete change of mind, a new direction of will, and an altered state of purpose and orientation for all of life. That's repentance. Though so John's baptism had its source in the Jewish ritual of spiritual pur purification, whereby a person would occasionally and symbolically cleanse himself or herself of sin in the running water of a stream, this was not what John was inaugurating. He may have been using the form, but he was doing something different. The baptism of repentance was new. It was a once-only act that signified the renouncing of sin once and for all. John's baptism did not confer a righteousness which could never be lost, but it marked out those who were the elect, those who prepared themselves to meet Christ, who would then be baptized by the Holy Spirit, the agent of righteousness who would complete their baptism. So baptism is a two-fold sacrament, and today it still is. When we, when we are baptized, we confess with our tongues that Jesus Christ is Lord and then we received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. John knew that his mission as Christ's witness was to point others away from him to Jesus. He was the one more powerful. And so in the face of Christ, John recognized his unworthiness, which put him so far below Jesus that the distance was greater even than the greatest human gulf between the lowest slave in the household and his master. Even a slave could kneel down at his master's feet to untie the laces of his sandals. But John saw his role as inferior even to this. Mark goes on. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now Mark does not include a narrative of Jesus' birth, but he affirmed his identity, both human and divine, in the baptism. Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, but he had to turn away from his earthly home, his family, his friends, and his livelihood and toward God's purpose for him. His baptism was a sign of his own metanoia, not because of sin, for he was without sin, but as a symbolic turning away from the desires of humanness toward the will of God as he undertook his ministry. 
And when Jesus arose from the water, the symbol of rebirth, the heavens were torn open as the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus with the gentleness of a dove. And this picture is of the eternal God ripping a hole in time to enter into the temporal universe at the moment of Jesus' baptism. And only once more would Mark use this Greek word as he recorded the rending of the temple veil from top to bottom at the moment that Jesus died on the cross, the tearing open of time by eternity once again as Jesus returned to the Father. It's a very dramatic scene here. Now the Spirit's appearance to Jesus like a dove recalled the dove sent out by Noah after the flood in search of the reborn world. Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit would offer the world rebirth through his life, death, and resurrection. And he alone heard those words of God. Words of love meant only for the ears of his Son, as he was united with the Father and the Spirit to bring the kingdom of heaven into the world. Mark continues with the story. At once, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. So immediately, and, and Mark will use this word immediately, often in his gospel, as the movement of the story goes on quickly. Immediately, Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man, was sent out by the Spirit into the wilderness, to do battle against the prince of the world, who was Satan. Now, echoing Israel's 40 years in the wilderness, Jesus endured 40 days of testing in the wilderness, alone and accompanied only by the wild beasts. But there was no enmity between Jesus and the animals, because Jesus himself created them at the beginning of the world. The wilderness picture that Mark drew envisioned Jesus as the antitype of Adam, he was the new Adam, once again restoring paradise where the lion could lay down with the lamb. In Christ's wilderness, however, Satan was no match for him who would not succumb to temptation as had the original Adam. Throughout his days of testing, the angels waited upon him, a sign of his relationship with God and proof that the battle over evil which would end in victory on the cross, was already won in the wilderness. Mark goes on. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So John's ministry of proclamation ended with his arrest. And if you know the story, his death. And the time was now right for Jesus to begin proclaiming the good news of God. The baptism of repentance proclaimed by John was to be followed by the declaration of faith that the good news of God was now at hand in Jesus himself, who was both the messenger and the message. The good news had begun. Mark's message of the good news was grounded in the eyewitness testimonies of Peter, the ancient prophets, of John the Baptist, and of the angels and the Holy Spirit. But his gospel was not meant as a historical record alone. It was an urgent appeal to those Christians in his time who were suffering persecution and discouragement. 2,000 years later, Mark's message is just as vital for us to hear as well as for us to live out the good news of the kingdom of heaven. In Mark's time, the Christians lived in dire fear of their lives. And if you know anything about uh, ancient world history, uh, in the reign of Nero, um, they were under heavy persecution from Rome, rounded up, killed, brought into the uh, Colosseum as, as human prey, uh, lit up as human candles on the streets of Rome, um, they were to be exterminated. Now we don't live in such dire times now, but there's a lot going on which is very concerning for us. And so I think if we look at Mark's gospel in that light, 
we're going to learn a lot that's going to help us in our walk with the Lord. The first thing is if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must repent. There's no getting around that. Just as a, a growing plant reorients itself towards the sun, we must reorient our lives toward God. For only in God's light, in God's will, and in God's plan can we enter into and thrive in the kingdom of heaven. If you've been baptized, you have already entered the kingdom of heaven, which begins here on earth for those who repent and believe the good news. That's what Jesus calls us to do. And once we've given our lives to God, he then gives us the power in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, who gives us the power to live out God's kingdom while we still live in the kingdom of the world and all of its pitfalls, sins, and evils. Now, like Jesus, we will be tempted by the prince of this world and those who follow him. But through the Holy Spirit, we can resist temptation, for we already possess the power of victory over our sins. We often live as defeated people, but we should live as victors. The second thing is, to live in the kingdom of God means that we, like John the Baptist, have a ministry to point others to Jesus. There's a vivid old English word which has fallen into disuse but gives a great illumination for, God, for John's ministry. A person who paved a road in old English times was known as a pavior. John was the one working in the spiritual wilderness to pave a path for Christ to come and be received. John literally was the pavior for the Savior. And so we, like John, are called into the wilderness of other people's lives to prepare the way to help them meet Jesus. We are to be the paviors for the Savior today. Has Jesus saved you? Well, tell someone about him. Don't be afraid. The Holy Spirit's going to give you the opportunity and the right words. Someone once told you the good news. The apostles never stopped proclaiming the good news of Jesus, and their message has reached forward across the ages to you. Reach out to someone who hasn't heard the good news. God's going to give you that opportunity. And maybe one day, someone will read those words of Isaiah. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. And they will be thinking of you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your faithful servant, John Mark, who was the first to record the good news about your suffering servant, your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, embolden us with the power of the Holy Spirit you gave to us to be your servants, telling the good news of your salvation through your Son, like Mark, and to, like your faithful servant John, become paviors for our Savior, preparing the way for those who don't know Jesus to meet him and receive the good news. For Christ's sake, amen. amen. The Apostle